excuse me. Uh, I'm also glad to be here because I like to be anywhere where I don't get interrupted. And uh, I say that you, for those I, in the I, audience who might seen. recognize me from the McLaughlin Group, which is a televised public affairs show, but it's really more like a televised food fight. And uh, we meet once a week and we kind of bang each other around the head and ears and we debate uh, contemporary uh, policies. And although I've been with Newsweek virtually my entire adult life, I have more notoriety, if you will, from the McLaughlin Group. So I could really relate to Julian when he spoke this morning. And of all his many accomplishments in his life, the one that he mentioned when he took the microphone was hosting Saturday Night Live. So we live in a kind of a pop culture, and um, I think we all uh, need to use that to our best advantage and to the best advantage of the society. So as a, as a journalist, I've long labored in the vineyards of, of truth of print journalism. And my real life is Newsweek, where I've spent virtually uh, my entire uh, adult life. And uh, those years parallel the entry of women into public life in a major way. Now, I'm really talking about the 1970s. So I have written a lot and spoken a lot about women in politics. And when I got a call, uh, several years ago, asking if I wanted to write a, a book about the 19th Amendment, I at first wasn't even quite sure what it was. I thought maybe prohibition? Actually, that was the 18th Amendment, and it was repealed in 1933, thankfully. Uh, the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote. And I think the, the women's fight for suffrage in this country is really a neglected part of history. Most of us, if, if we learned about it at all, we learned about it in a textbook which was about other fights for equality and there was like a little box with a very stern looking woman staring out at us. Uh, it said women marched for 30 years and then they were given the vote. Well, it's much more complicated than that. And I really applaud the Henry Ford Museum and part of its exhibit on the expanding freedoms in America that they uh, include the suffrage movement, which really began in 1848 and didn't conclude until 1920. So it was a very long period of time, and it had all the twists and turns of a, a modern thriller. It had racial and class tensions. Some women were angry when President Lincoln pushed through the 13th Amendment, which is now uh, commemorated in the Spielberg movie, which is terrific, by the way, Lincoln, because it gave the vote to black men, but there was no mention of women. I focused in uh, the book that I wrote on two of the early suffragists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and I think of them as poetry and prose. Stanton was married, she had seven children, she was kind of a round, roly-poly woman who enjoyed life, laughed a lot. Susan B. Anthony was a very stern uh, workaholic, really. She devoted her life to the suffrage movement. She never married. She was a school teacher. She traveled, and travel in those days was really very difficult, even though TSA wasn't around. It was still pretty, pretty hard. Uh, and these two women collaborated for decades. And Anthony would get frustrated when Stanton would take time off to have a child. She had seven in all. And she was a very uh, laissez-faire uh, housekeeper and mother, if you will. And, and uh, Anthony recalls in one of her diaries walking past the Stanton household and seeing the Stanton boys on the roof debating whether if they rolled the baby off the roof whether he would bounce or not. Um, but they, they, were, they were great friends, totally opposite personalities, and together they actually mainstreamed suffrage. They were invited to the White House, they were fated at various social events, uh, Anthony in, in particular, but they both died uh, well before women achieved the vote. So I focused on 
a young woman named Alice Paul. She was a young woman. She was brought up as a Quaker. She initially spoke using thee and thou. She was a very devout Quaker. And uh, after graduating from college, she went abroad uh, to do a semester, which kind of stunned me that they did that in the early 1900s, but they did. And she went to England, and she uh, studied the women's movement in England, and it's where she became radicalized. She was arrested there. Uh, there was exchange of letters between her family and the ambassador, and uh, it was, she came from quite a prominent family. And anyway, she arrives back into the U.S., radicalized about women's place in society, and amazed at how docile women were in America about their position in uh, public life. So in, in the early 1900s, she begins to organize the first protest of a presidential inaugural. And when Woodrow Wilson arrived at Union Station in March of 1913, because inaugurations then were in March, not January, he got off the train and he looked around and he said, where are all the crowds to greet me? And he was told they were over on the avenue looking at the ladies. The avenue was Pennsylvania Avenue, and the ladies were a march, 3,000 women strong, that Alice Paul had organized. Women in their academic gowns, in their factory clothes, uh, marching. And uh, it was a beautiful sight. It was a, a spectacle that Americans had never seen before. But lining the parade route were a lot of men who didn't like uh, the way society was changing. And they taunted the women. They threw tomatoes. And it turned into a real melee. Some people were hurt. Uh, some people were um, taken, taken to the hospital, and it turned into a real scandal. The um, district police on horseback just stood aside and let it happen. The chief of police actually lost his job over that in, in hearings several uh, months later. But the headlines the next day were you know, over 100 women uh, in, in, hospital, in the hospital as a result of this uh, uh, march. And some of the more mainstream suffragists were, were horrified. They thought these were really barbarian tactics. They didn't want violence to infiltrate the women's movement. But Alice Paul looked at it with a, a new, young, contemporary eye, and she realized she'd gotten the attention of the nation. The coverage was sympathetic. The coverage sided with the women, not the uh, people who had perpetrated the, the chaos. And so she really got a sense from this experience of what could be done and what must be done to break through if you want to make change in America. Subsequently, after Wilson took office, uh, women were jailed for protesting outside the White House and for allegedly breaking laws about um, uh, uh, staying too long uh, in front of the White House. They were, they were beaten. They went on hunger strikes. They were, they were brutalized. And with Alice Paul's uh, advice and consent, they smuggled notes out of jail about how brutalized they'd been, which she turned into press releases. Now, um, last night when other people were waiting for the lights to go on at the Super Bowl, I happened upon an HBO movie that um, portrayed uh, Gloria Steinem, Gloria in her own words. And it reminded me of how the contemporary women's movement really echoes uh, the past. And there's another HBO movie called Iron Jawed Angels, which came out several years ago and stars Hilary Swank as Alice Paul. And the name Iron Jawed Angels comes from the iron clamp that was forcibly put over the mouths of women when they were on a hunger strike, and then they would pour raw eggs down their throat. Uh, it was pretty uh, brutal uh, procedure. And when Wilson was in office, um, the women who were jailed, these were uh, prominent upper-class women who would be attending teas somewhere if they weren't protesting. 
and their husbands were uh, donors to the Wilson uh, campaign effort. And so the husbands persuaded the president to pardon uh, these women, and which Wilson did. It was a blanket pardon. He expected them all to just go back home and tend to their, uh, their knitting. Instead, they went right back on the protest line, standing by the White House gates. When it got cold, they would have bri bricks heated to stand on, but they didn't, they didn't go home. And when Wilson was first elected, he was kind of amused at first by these, this line of women outside uh, the White House, and he would tip his hat to them when he went out on his chariot ride with his wife to go for a round of golf. Uh, it's quite a different from today, where nobody leaves the White House if you're a president unless you're in an armored, armored car. But storm clouds were brewing in Europe, and World War I was beginning to come into shape. And Wilson thought, you know, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for these women. And his wife really urged him in that direction. Edith Galt was her name. It was his second wife who he married uh, while in office. She looked at the suffragists and she, she described them. She called them disgusting creatures. And I was always struck by that because uh, later in Wilson's presidency, when he suffers a stroke, uh, Edith Galt, she sat in the Oval Office every day. She learned to decipher the codes around uh, World War I. The uh, Republicans on, on the Hill were, were outraged. They called it petticoat government. But she never saw any relationship between the prominent role she took in sharing her husband's presidency, if not running it, uh, and what uh, these women who were protesting uh, wanted. So Wilson finally, under increasing pressure, he sends the a, a declaration of suffrage to the Congress, and he calls it a war measure because women are they're folding bandages, they're greeting the troops, they're really on the front lines and keeping up the country's morale. But there was still plenty of uh, political maneuvering uh, behind uh, the, the uh, legislation because suffrage had now become popular. And so they had jockeying between the two parties as to which party would get credit for passing uh, suffrage. So finally it passes. And now it needs 36 states to ratify it. And it comes down to Tennessee. And there's a tie vote in Tennessee, which means suffrage would have just ended if they couldn't break the tie. And in the last uh, minutes of the uh, debate, a young man, the youngest member of the Tennessee legislator, le legislature, stands up and says he had gotten a uh, telegram from his mother that morning urging him to be a good boy and put the rat, R-A-T, in, into ratification. And so he was from Mouse Creek, Tennessee. And he later said that you know, his mother was college educated. She read several newspapers. And when he thought about it, he had initially sided with the residents of Mouse Creek, who did not favor uh, ratification. But he realized, as he put it, I, I would be on record for all time and eternity. I had to support ratification. He was elected one more time to a term, but he needed a bodyguard when he went home to his uh, district. It was that controversial. So if you study the suffragists and their tactics, if you will, you can see the template for the civil rights movement. And for the women's movement of the 1970s. I call it the contemporary women's movement because I was alive through that, and anything I was alive for has got to be contemporary. Um, and um, there, there is a, a, a new book out about Rosa Parks, which takes issue with the way that she has been depicted as this meek seamstress who was tired from a day of work and that this was kind of almost an accidental defiance of, of segregation. Uh, the book notes, and I think we've all learned since, that Rosa Parks was an activist who for almost 20 years before the confrontation in the bus uh, worked locally on behalf of civil rights, and she worked as a secretary in the local NAACP office. You're going to hear from the author of this new book, 
uh, Jean Theo Harris this afternoon. The book is titled The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. And uh, Jean Theo Harris is a, a professor at, uh, at Brooklyn College. And the, and the book is certainly well-timed and getting a lot of well-deserved uh, attention. And I remember, uh, as, as I mentioned, I was in the Atlanta Bureau of Newsweek. And I, I remember learning some time ago that the local NAACP in Montgomery had had several opportunities to go ahead with a lawsuit to try to gain equal access to public accommodations. But they were waiting for just the right person, someone who could be portrayed as sympathetic and win broad uh, support, and someone who could stand up under the scrutiny and the withering attacks that would be uh, sure to come. And Rosa Parks certainly uh, demonstrated her mettle on all those uh, fronts. And then last night, as I mentioned, I kind of stumbled on this HBO documentary about Gloria Steinem. And it chronicles uh, her life, which we think of her as this, you know, again, the icon of the women's movement. But um, she, too, did not have an easy time along the way, suffering with bouts of uh, uh, lack of self-esteem and, and depression and, and wondering whether what she was doing was... was was the, the, the right course, but the um, documentary ends with her saying, I do want to live to be 100, and she's closing in on 80 years old. She says, I, I love it so much, and, and I don't want it to end. And I remember when uh, Gloria Steinem turned 50 and stood up and said, this is what 50 looks like, and when she turned 50, you know, a lot of people thought, well, that was that was ushering you into, uh, into old age. And um, a lot of women looked at her and said, that's what 50 looks like, and their jaws dropped. Because she, she had a lot more to work with than most of us do, I think. But um, she has redefined every age she's in. And I certainly uh, commend her for it. But this uh, documentary is not just about the, the positive sides of being a pioneer uh, in, in terms of activism. Uh, there's one portion there where she is taking calls and she's on the Larry King show and uh, one woman calls in and says, I hope you rot in hell for how you've destroyed the American family. And Larry King was surprised. He said, I thought all women were indebted to Gloria Steinem for what she did. Well, what I came away uh, from hearing that exchange thinking is that anything that shakes what we think is the natural order is going to get pushed back. And Steinem was, she was a beautiful woman and she put a face on feminism that made it harder for men to write off the women's movement as a place for women who can't get a man. And I think the women in the audience of a certain age will remember that's how it was depicted uh, initially. Now, the, the women's movement basically rocked my world in a very good way. Uh, I was working at Newsweek as a secretary, and then I was in the Atlanta Bureau as a Girl Friday. Uh, I get lots of jokes about, you. what do you do on the weekend if you're Girl Friday? It's a term that isn't used very often anymore. But we covered seven states in the South, and when the three male reporters were out traveling, I was kind of holding down the fort, and I learned how to do reporting. We would get in these roundups. For example, in the 70s, when, when divorce became prevalent, the great minds in New York said, find a woman who wants to be on the cover of Newsweek to talk about her divorce. That wasn't actually very easy. <laughs> and I remember my bureau chief calling women and saying, you know, most people go through their whole life without ever being on the cover of Newsweek. You know, this is your chance. Well, most people would rather go through life without being on the cover of Newsweek for something that they weren't particularly interested in talking about. But I learned how to do reporting uh, that way, and in, but I wasn't recognized for it. I was still the, the Girl Friday. And then in 1970, um, the magazine had been in the forefront of covering the anti-war movement, in the forefront of covering the civil rights movement. but we didn't do so well on covering the women's movement. And in March of 1970, 
Uh, Newsweek did its first cover, and I think probably it was the first cover in any mainstream magazine. It was called Women in Revolt. And it talked about these consciousness-raising groups and what was going around, and women were restive and all of that. And the same morning that that magazine hit the newsstands, hit the newsstands is probably a phrase that should be retired since there aren't many newsstands left, but there were lots then. And so when that magazine came out that very morning, 46 women who worked for the magazine in New York held a press conference to announce they were suing Newsweek for gender discrimination. Uh, in those days, the magazines had this really cast order. The reporters and the writers were men, the secretarial staff and the researchers were women. And the research jobs were really, they were considered a very good job for a woman, which is how it was portrayed. And the researchers were, for the most part, graduates of the finest uh, colleges, mostly the Seven Sisters Colleges or Berkeley or Columbia, really elite institutions. And they, they all wanted to be writers. Nora Ephron was there when I was in, in New York, and her parents had been, you know, playwrights and script writers, and she knew she wanted to be a writer, and she knew she knew how to do it, and yet these opportunities were denied uh, to the women. So they finally got themselves a lawyer, and the lawyer's name I think some of you will recognize, Eleanor Holmes Norton. She represents uh, the District of Columbia today in Congress, and uh, she, was, she was just starting her career in public interest law, and she took the lawsuit. And she told uh, the women at Newsweek that if you want to get change at Newsweek, you, you have to stop acting like ladies, and you're going to have to be, you have to press for this. And Lynn Povich, who uh, was a um, researcher and writer at Newsweek during that period, was the main uh, instigator of, of, of the lawsuit. And she has a book out, it's called The Good Girls Revolt because these were girls who were brought up to do the right thing and were kind of stunned when they found uh, the, the doors to opportunity were closed. It's a very good book and it, it chronicles how Newsweek uh, reacted to the lawsuit. Uh, it required, I believe, a subsequent lawsuit and a lot of pressure, but the magazine opened up uh, jobs reporting jobs to women and said that by a certain date, a third of the women, a third of the uh, reporting jobs would have to be women, by a certain date, a female senior editor and so forth. And so they created internships for women already at the magazine. So I still remember the day I, I tiptoed into my boss's office in Atlanta, Georgia, and asked if I could have one of those internships. Now. I, to be honest, I hadn't graduated from college and I'd never taken a journalism course, but I had learned enough being in that environment. And um, looking at these women and what they were pressing for, I thought, you know, I could do that too. And so I got an internship, and um, at the end of that internship, I became a reporter. I was a junior reporter in Atlanta when um, the 1976 presidential campaign was underway and they were looking for someone to cover a candidate who they thought would never win. His name is Jimmy Carter and um, I covered the campaign. If you cover the winning campaign, you get to go to Washington. So I've been in Washington ever since. I call it my Cinderella story. So um, I Newsweek just had its, uh, published its last print edition, so that's end of an era. Um, we're now exciting new digital age, that's how I'm supposed to put it. <laughs> um, but it made me reflect on how the world has been transformed over my lifetime. We have a uh, black president for the first time who's been reelected, and I heard Vernon Jordan, another great civil rights leader from Atlanta, speak at the, at the portrait gallery where his portrait was installed last year, and this is before the election, and he said how it was more important for President Obama to be reelected than it was for him to be elected. And I called him up afterwards and I said, why do you say that? And he recounted uh, his own story. Now Vernon is probably 
uh, close to 80 years of age, and he grew up in public housing in Atlanta. And he was accepted at DePauw College, and he remembers his parents driving him to DePauw and his uh, father telling him, you can't come home, boy, and said, what do you mean? He said, everybody here is much more prepared than you. You're going to be in the preface, and they're going to be in the seventh chapter. you got to read, boy, read. And he said his mother slipped him $50. And four years later, Vernon's big man on campus, graduates with all kinds of recognition. Parents come to pick him up, and the father says, you can come home now and the mother slips him $100. So I thought that, you know, to me that said it all, what this re-election uh, meant. It really ratified uh, an election that some people tried to pretend was an accident. And we've got Hillary Clinton, a woman who is the undisputed front runner for the Democratic nomination. Four years is a long time away, but I can't remember a woman being the front runner except in 08, and it didn't work out so well for her then, but she's going to get a second chance. Uh, Nancy Pelosi for, was the first female speaker, now ranking uh, member, minority leader in the House. And for the first time, we have a Democratic caucus that's a majority minority on the, on the Democratic side. And in the U.S. Senate, one out of every five uh, seats is held by a, a woman. That's still not 50-50. Uh, but, uh, man, the change that I've seen in my uh, lifetime. And uh, after I wrote a piece in the final edition of Newsweek about what it was like covering the women's movement within the magazine and then looking out at the world, uh, young women would say, oh, it must have been so frustrating for you. Weren't you impatient? And I said, no. From where I sat, everything seemed like a small miracle. And that doesn't mean that the fight is over. We have to keep pressing on all these fronts. And this last election, I think, showed us with all the attempts made at voter suppression and the attacks on women's health and reproductive rights show us that rights uh, acquired uh, can be taken away. But it also showed us there is power in collective action and when you have a handful of strong personalities, and we're certainly recognizing one today in Rosa Parks, but there are also countless acts by countless others that contribute to the transformation that so many of us have seen. And it's all those acts that you know weave together to form the tapestry of history. And so I, it's a great honor for me to be here at this wonderful museum which really does tell the American story in such a compelling way. And uh, I know I'm followed by another event, but they said uh, if uh, you want to ask questions, they're prepared to have you ask questions. So I'm going to take off my glasses and see if anybody wants to stand up and be brave and, and ask the first question. There comes the microphone. <laughs> OK. Good. All right. <laughs> Eleanor, as a print journalist, how do you see journalism changing as it goes to a digital age? It, it's different to read something on a computer than it is in a magazine that you can go back to and look at again. Yeah. Did you all hear the question, the difference? You know, um, I have a White House pass, and if you have a White House pass and you're with a mainstream institution, you get to do pool duty every uh, month or so. And so my day fell on a recent Sunday when all the president was doing was going out to watch uh, his daughter Sasha's basketball game. Now, uh, they hustled us out into vans, and you sit in the van, you never even get sight of the president. You don't know whether Sasha's team won or anything. You're there. It's basically just the pool protection that is constant around a president's life. So we had to sit in the van during the duration of the basketball game. I was expecting this. So I brought my New York Times and its blue wrapper and my Washington Post and its cream colored wrapper. And I sat in the van peeling section after section and ripping pages and reading it. And I noticed that the other people in the van, nobody <laughs> was reading a newspaper. They all had their devices. 
And the young man sitting next to me looked over at me and said, you know, you don't see too many people reading like that anymore. <laughs> and I realized how antiquated I must look. And when I go out the end of my walkway to pick up my papers in the morning, I, you know, that's probably going to be a lost art. So I think we have lost something, but you know, the internet also opens up, you know, so many opportunities, and you can't, you have to live in the present or or, or the future. But I do think there are a lot of people in journalism who are concerned that long-form uh, journalism, which is not all that comfortable on, on, on the internet, uh, and the resources that mainstream media once had, um, I, I can't, you know, I thought it was going to always be like that in the days uh, when Newsweek was at the top of its game. And those resources are not there for the kind of travel and, uh, you know, people are even reluctant to go out and cover events when you could just turn on C-SPAN. So something is lost here, but I do think that, you know, people are, are, are struggling to make sure that the future we go into does not lose the, you know, the, the, the strong parts of the journalism that many of us uh, grew up with in terms of, you know, fact-checking and investigation and, and doing, you know, what I guess Chuck Todd calls a, a, the deep dive. You know, so um, I think we're all mindful of this, but this is uncharted territory. And, um, you know, in a way, we've met the enemy and the enemy is us. It's what people demand is what they'll get. And if people say, enough with the trivia, give us more meat and potatoes, they'll get it. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a history question. Uh, I was very intrigued by your connection made between the suffrage movement and the civil rights movement. And I was wondering, uh, do early civil rights leaders connect intellectually to that past? Do they think self-consciously about uh, women's suffrage? I think if you uh, go back, you can find that Martin Luther King Jr. did recognize that and had studied the earlier uh, movement. So I think there was some recognition. But you know, so much of uh, these movements kind of arise organically. I don't know that there's a whole lot of planning, but if you look at, you know, the suffrage movement came first, and the civil rights movement, even the letter from the Birmingham jail, uh, the women were smuggling their notes out of jail, what, many decades, a century or, or uh, before that, almost a century uh, before that. So, now half a century, I gotta, I gotta do my, my arithmetic correct here. Um, but, and it was Coretta, Coretta King, who um, a lot of her husband's friends kind of uh, belittled her for care. She cared about history all the time. She wanted to save stuff. And they thought, oh, she was just trying to grandize herself. She thought she was the, the black Jackie. I was in Atlanta during that period, so I was familiar with all of that. God bless Coretta King, because she, she saw that this was an historical thing. When people are in the middle of making history, they don't necessarily think that's what they're doing. They're just getting through the next day and trying to avoid getting shot at, basically. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, and Andrew Young would probably, uh, some of the more intellectuals in the movement, I'm sure, would, uh, would, would recognize what, what lessons they borrowed uh, from the women's movement, suffrage movement, yeah. yes. I, the suffrage movement, I don't understand now why all of a sudden all of uh, our politicians want to change women's rights. What is it now that want to make them change all of the rights for us? Like the president did sign the Ledbetter Act for women with equal pay. Now, but everybody wants to change and make decisions for us. What is it now that's bringing all this to the forefront? You know, I remember Hillary Clinton gave a speech, um, it was a year ago in New York, and uh, she said, you know, terrorist movements or, you know, or right-wing movements around the world, whatever their goals are, should they always want to subjugate women. It's the kind of a common theme. So there's something, uh, I guess, they think women are still the, 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 less, the lesser creature, and it's the old saying, you know, better barefoot and pregnant, and they want to restore the old order. But I think the Republicans really learned a lesson in this last election, because they, 
desperately need more women in their ranks. Um, as uh, Senator Levin said earlier today, there was no pushback on creating a, the Rosa Parks stamp. I, you know, it's hard to believe that there would have been at any period in time, but sure, they resisted the Martin Luther King holiday. So the Republicans have been, I think, on the wrong side a lot of these issues for a long time. And the only thing that gets them right on these issues is when the voters speak out, and we're seeing that with immigration reform. I mean, uh, Senator McCain is quite clear about it. What changed? Obama got 70% of the Hispanic vote. <laughs> so now you know, Republicans are struggling their way with a lot of opposition within their party to try to find a path to you know, correct, correct that in the, in, in the way they present themselves uh, to the voters. And with women, you know, we've ever since uh, Roe passed in 1973, there's been a pushback on the abortion issue. And um, in, in political terms, the uh, pollsters always talk about intensity. And you know, the majority of the country, nobody, nobody likes abortion, but they recognize the reality of it, and it should be safe, legal, and rare, which is how President Clinton uh, uh, put it. But the intensity is with those who don't want abortion in any instances. And the way the Congress is so, the House in particular, is so gerrymandered, a lot of these really conservative legislators, um, they're, you know, they're, they're responding to their constituents. And uh, they, really, they really missed it in this, in this last election. And a couple of those, the two gentlemen who spoke out, who were so widely ridiculed on their knowledge of how a woman's body works, um, they were both members of the House. They were duly elected. So these are not people who just arrived from another planet. And so I think the you know, Republican Party is now trying to figure out how, how they can change the way they present themselves on these issues without actually changing their positions on these issues. And that's going to be very tricky. And uh, so I think we're, we're still in for some rough sailing. And nobody should be complacent. Uh, Obama did win re-election, his approval rating is high, but man, the, you know, the storm clouds are already gathering for 2014, and we saw what happened in 2010 when uh, not enough people showed up and the Republicans took the House, and they could well take the Senate too if, uh, if the President's uh, coalition of voters uh, doesn't, doesn't stay together even though he's not on the ballot. So again, is a lesson out there every day how important it is to make your voice heard. And I have three grown sons, and I've always said to them, you know, you can do anything and I'll love you unconditionally, but if you don't vote, I'm going to have a problem with that. <laughs> it's a basic ticket of admission to the society. So thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. This is it on? This is a bit of a follow up. Whether it's Hillary Clinton or not, what do you think are the biggest obstacles for a woman to be elected president? Oh, that's a very good question. You know, I think the biggest obstacle always used to be that a woman, uh, difficult for people to imagine a woman as a commander in chief. And I think that's going to be gone. I mean, it, if you look at the way Hillary handled uh, the way when she was questioned on Benghazi, versus Senator Hagel, who I admire and I trust will be confirmed, but the way he handled his confirmation hearing, who was more presidential? <laughs> who was more of a commander in chief? And now that they've lifted the exclusionary rule on women in combat, I think some of the, the, that division over imagining a woman leading the troops, is uh, much of it is, is erased. Um, you know, if Hillary does get back into the fray, I'm sure, you know, she's enjoying record high poll ratings now, but she knows better than most that the minute she puts on her hat and becomes a politician again, that they'll be after her on, on everything they can imagine. And so when I think of uh, obstacles to a woman, it's hard for me to think of obstacles to a generic woman because there's really only one at the moment that most of us can imagine really being taken seriously as a candidate. And maybe that's the biggest obstacle, that there's only one. And, um, you know, so um, it's still a question of, you know, where do women come from uh, running for president? They come from the Senate or they come from governors? 
One out of five is a, is a record in the Senate, but still very small. And I think there are only five or six female governors out of 50. So uh, that's the biggest obstacle, it is the fact that there aren't enough credible role models that when people can look at and think, oh, which of these women <laughs> would I vote for as president when there's all, all the hopes and dreams are attached to, to one woman. That's a lot, that's a pretty heavy burden for that one woman. Take one more question, and this right. will be the last one right here. All right, Okay, Eleanor. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I'm always reminding my three grown daughters uh, that women did not have the right to vote in this country until my mother, their grandmother, was born, the year that she was born. Um, why do you think there's not more awareness uh, of, of that, uh, uh, that uh, it's been so recent that women have uh, started to achieve uh, full rights? Now, I'm not quite sure that the sound here is very difficult. Uh, you're asking uh, why why has it taken so long to recognize what? Well, it's not that long ago that women got the right to vote when my mother was born. Right. Why isn't there more awareness of that? Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, I must say, I started out, when, when I got a call, did I want to write about the 19th Amendment, you know, I wasn't quite sure what it, what it was. I don't remember getting steeped in any education about the women's uh, movement. You know, you can get into a broader question. Uh, we, you know, history is written by the winners, and uh, history has been mostly written until recently, really, by the men who kind of ran the show. And the women's movement was considered kind of incidental for a long period. And until you kind of dig deeper, you understand what a rich period uh, that was in, in, in our history, and how in a single day, you know, more more people were enfranchised uh, than, than ever before. But that year was 1920, and uh, Warren Harding ran, and he uh, won, and he turned out to be one of the most corrupt presidents that we'd had. And I think it, people went back to thinking, what does it matter if women vote or not? You know, the, the theory always was they'll vote like their husbands, and then when we discover, no, they really don't vote by their husbands, well, okay, so then they cancel out their husbands. So people didn't really see the women's vote as uh, an independent force. And it only came into sharp relief when Reagan ran in 1980 and uh, the gender gap was discovered. And when, when more women were worried about him as being you know, too reckless and starting nuclear war, that this phenomenon, the gender gap, showed up. And that's been evident ever since. And in this last election, it was quite huge. And so now the women's vote has become analyzed and probed and, 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 and seen as the great prize in every election because we vote in bigger numbers. We're a larger portion of, of, the, uh, of the electorate. And it, but it's taken from 1920 to 1980 to recognize its importance, and from 1980 until recent history to see that it could be determinative. And uh, so now, and, and certainly we also have gone through a period where we thought, well, all women thought the same. Well, I think the, um, we've been disabused of that. Um, the pro-life movement uh, uh, created a lot of activists who came to Congress. And uh, I mean, I, I, I remember, I was fairly, it was kind of naive thinking on my part, but I always assumed, well, all women thought the same, certainly when it came to women's issues. Well, that's not the case at all. Women are quite uh, diverse, but there are some issues that will unite women. And if you mess too much <laughs> with their bodies, even if they are not in favor of abortion rights, you're going to get a backlash, and I think we saw that in this in this last election. So, yeah. So, so women um, have really taken their place in the forefront of society to the point where, you know, when I came here, I was reading on the plane a piece in the it's in the New York Times about the fact that colleges are now so overwhelmingly female that we have to worry about our boys. So. Um, and it's one thing about history, it, it, it's, it repeats itself, but there's always something new. And so maybe the next time I visit here, I'll be talking about the boys' movement, who knows? Thank you very much, appreciate it.